In part one, we explored King David's early life, from pauper prince to prince of the Cumbrians, and now, in 1124, the throne of Scotland is vacant, as the Lord Chronicles explains. On the 23rd of April, King Alexander of Scotland passed away, and David, his brother, who was Earl of Northamptonshire, succeeded to the kingdom and held them both together, the Kingdom of Scotland and the Earldom in England. This text implies a smooth transition of power between the two brothers. However, this may not have been the case as there were others who could claim the Scottish throne. As mentioned before, the laws of primogenitor were not apparent in Scotland yet. The first claimant is William Fitz Duncan, the son of David's older half-brother, Duncan II, who by all accounts could pose a serious challenge to David, as William is described as an able warrior and commander, and would later lead Scottish armies on behalf of his uncle. We don't know the exact reason why William never mounted a challenge. David Oram states, the answer is probably that David and his supporters brought off William with a bargain that must have appeared to satisfy his ambitions. William may have been aware that challenging his uncle would prove incredibly difficult, especially with the support of the English king, and the potential deal being offered was enough for him, and he would potentially become Tarnister, meaning heir, over David's young son, Henry. The second challenge to the throne came shortly after King David's coronation in Schoon. Only Audric Vitalis mentions Malcolm Mac Alexander, the illegitimate son of Alexander I. No other source mentions Malcolm's uprising against King David. Audric tells us from Normandy, affected to snatch the kingdom from David and fought against him to sufficiently fierce battles. But David, who was loftier in understanding and in power and wealth, conquered him and his followers. Despite the defeat, Malcolm was not killed or captured, but instead fled to parts of Scotland not under complete jurisdiction by King David. Malcolm would become a thorn in King David's side in the next decade. With the dynastic problems over for now, King David could now focus on statesmanship and issuing charters. King David's reign also has a unique title of this period in Scotland, called the Davidian Revolution. The term is coined from the extensive changes and developments in Scotland during King David's reign, ranging from the development of monastic institutions such as Selkirk Abbey and the creation of boroughs, a self-governing town with a degree of autonomy. The first ever borough in Scotland was Berwick-upon-Tweed, or South Berwick, granted by King David in 1130. Another aspect of the revolution was bringing in Norman lords into Scotland, the most famous family being the de Bruce family, who King David granted the Lordship of Annadale to Robert de Bruce in 1124. The Davidian Revolution was bringing in European styles of government and administration to Scotland. For example, the swearing ceremony of lords to their land liege via Scottish feudalism, the creation of royal burrs, the military of Scotland would see King David having access to elite heavy Norman cavalry, the strengthening his control on the kingdom, and they would play a part in future conflicts. The piety of David's mother and sister would play a part in his development of religious buildings, as stated in the Chronicle of Malrose. In the year 1128, the Church of the Holy Rood at Edinburgh began to be founded, in the same year, the Church of Calso was founded. The first charter King David issued granted land to Robert de Bruce. What's interesting about this first charter is that the witnesses present, none of them were from the Gallic elite, apart from King David. The charter addresses King David's French and English subjects. And considering King David's background and upbringing in England was immersed in the Anglo-Norman culture, and King David's half-brother Duncan was seen as a hostile foreign figure in Scotland and only ruled for six months, King David would aim to avoid the same fate. So not by involving his Scottish subjects, he was avoiding displeasing them, while strengthening his power by bringing in new loyal men whom he knew he could trust. By 1126, King David felt comfortable leaving Scotland for a time, as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles tells us. Then, after Michaelmas, came David, the King of the Scots, from Scotland to this country, 
and King Henry received him with great ceremony, and he remained the whole year in this country. King David visited England for a few reasons. One of them was an ecclesiastical matter regarding the bishopric of York seeking jurisdiction over Scottish ones. The second issue was the succession of the throne of England. King Henry's only son and heir had died in 1120 in the White Ship disaster, and despite remarrying, Henry and his wife Adeliza had no children. The only legitimate heir King Henry had left was his daughter, Empress Matilda, King David's niece. To try and secure a smooth transition of power, King Henry had ordered that his subjects swore oaths of loyalty to support the Empress if King Henry died without producing a male heir. This was an excellent opportunity for King David to secure some political leverage to use in the future. As King David was one of the most powerful men in both England and Scotland, and given his close friendship with King Henry, King David swore the oath to the Empress first. With the swearing ceremony over, King David could now focus on the church affairs affecting his kingdom. The issue was that the Archbishop of York, Thurstan, sought to have authority over the Scottish bishops. Thurstan even tried to venture to Rome to speak with the Pope himself, but was convinced to only send messages by King Henry, returning the favour for King David's support. A truce was now in place for the religious matters. For the next few months, religious matters would dominate King David's attention. The first abbot of Dunfermline was anointed, and Selkirk Abbey was moved to Calso. Before we continue, it's important to mention the political landscape of Scotland and the physical borders in the High Middle Ages. Richard Aurum's David I, the king who made Scotland, explains the situation perfectly. For most of the 10th and 11th centuries, the kings of Scots had exercised a fluctuating measure of control over the northern regions of the mainland, beyond the mountain barriers of the Month. The control of most of the isles around Scotland were also not under Scottish jurisdiction. The isles had influence from Irish, Scotty and Viking, but during King David's reign, the isle was called the Kingdom of the Isles and were ruled by Alofair Gerardison, another protégé of King Henry. King David's father had campaigned to bring more of Northern Scotland into the kingdom, which at the time had various petty kingdoms, and each submitted to King Malcolm, but under what terms we don't know or whatever the terms were, they held at least until 1130. By 1130, King David was back in England to act as a judge in a trial in which a nobleman was accused of treachery. After the trial's conclusion, King David spent the spring in England attending to the business of his English lands. The year would mark a tremendous tragedy for King David as his wife, Queen Maud, died. Unfortunately, we have little to no information on the last few years of Queen Maud's life. Even her burial site is disputable. King David's love for his wife was profoundly deep, that he never remarried. But trouble was on the horizon for King David. The ruler of Murray, Angus, and Malcolm Mac Alexander had joined forces and invaded. The Kingdom of Murray had been one of the northern sub-kingdoms dominated by King David's father. Whether the timing was a coincidence of Queen Maud's death, we don't know, but the event was a major one, as it's mentioned in several chronicles. Annals of Ulster, Annals of Insenfallen, Chronicle of Malrose, and Orderic Vitalis all record the uprising and the subsequent battle. Both Angus and Malcolm had claims to the Scottish throne, although Angus would have been the one to be placed on the throne if they succeeded. Yet King David was still in England, so the defence of the realm fell to Edward, a cousin of King David. The rebel army travelled from Murray down to Stracathro, where they were engaged by the Royal Scottish Army. Only one source states the number of men of Murray, some 5,000 strong according to Vitalis, and some 10,000 Scots. The battle was hard fought as both sides suffered casualties. The Scots lost a thousand men, whereas the men of Murray lost 4,000, including their king. The Scots' losses were attributed to a counter-attack, possibly led by Malcolm, who once again escaped. With this defeat, Murray was subdued, and later the lands were given to King David's half-nephew, William Fitz Duncan, 
after a period of subjugation. Malcolm would later be captured in 1134 and spent the rest of his life as a prisoner in Roxburgh Castle. With no major uprising since 1130, King David continued with the development and consecration of new churches. King David would continue his revolution by gifting in return for vassalage the new lands that had been subjugated, although this would take time and manpower. King David would give land as colonies to Anglo-Norman lords and also to a Flemish mercenary who was given land in Duffis in northern Scotland and would later build Duffis Castle originally as a wooden Motten Bailey. King David's plan of a centralised kingdom was bearing fruit and by 1135 another opportunity to expand his power and influence came. On the 1st of December 1135, King Henry I of England died. The man who enabled King David to have all he had now was dead, and the English king's plan of succession was unravelled in the space of a few weeks. Now there was a new king on the throne, King Stephen, but his support in England wasn't universal. As he took an opportunic risk to take the throne, his actions would kick off a period in England called the Anarchy. So, if we examine the relationship between King David and King Henry, and then look at the same with King Stephen, we can see a different attitude from King David for the early years of King Stephen's reign. King David would be the biggest threat as he could easily invade the north of England and cause all sorts of chaos. As King David had already captured Carlisle and Newcastle in quick succession, the two would meet at Durham, but no fighting occurred and King David obtained the territories he wanted for him and his son Henry, who pledged fealty to King Stephen as an English Earl. The peace did not last for long. In the spring of 1137, King David demanded more land that he stated belonged to him, and despite a peace envoy, King David invaded and fought at the Battle of the Standard, and despite the defeat, King David managed to negotiate a settlement that benefited him greatly. The Scottish territorial claims of Cumberland and Northumberland were recognised. For the next two years, King David was dealing with the matters of church and state, as during the 1130s, there was an anti-pope which created a schism in the Catholic Church, creating arguments over bishops running which diocese, and to support the claims of each bishop, the Scots had sided with the anti-pope Anacletus, as he agreed with the Scots' terms, as during this time, Scottish monarchs were not crowned as kings, but rather they would sit on a ceremonial stone called the Stone of Destiny, along with a few more rituals involving recanting the genealogy of kings. Yet, King David wanted to be crowned by an archbishop, similar to England's crowning ceremony, but at the same time, King David wanted the Scottish Church to be free of influence by the English bishops, namely the Bishop of York. But, by 1138, the antipope was dead, and King David had no choice but to submit to whatever judgement the Pope brought. Yet King David and his bishops managed to linger the arguments and the negotiations long enough for the Archbishop of York to expire in 1140. The political power of the Yorkish bishopric would be reduced for many years. As the anarchy raged on in England, and King Stephen's terrible diplomacy with the church, King David could take the advantage, attacking York in 1149, but the garrison of York managed to push the Scottish forces back. The issue over the Scottish church subjugation would linger even after King David's death. By 1140, King David was firmly in control of Carlisle, and his son, the Prince Henry, was Earl of Huntingdon as an English vassal. For King David, the benefit of having good chunks of the north of England under his domain provided not only territorial power, but a financial boost, as the silver mines at Alston provided substantial revenue. One way a medieval monarch could project their power and prestige is to have good quality coinage made. With the silver from the mines, King David began to mint coins and had them distributed across Scotland. By 1149, King David was at the height of his power, 
Parts of England were firmly his, Cumbria, Lancaster and Northumberland, and most of mainland Scotland was certainly under a more centralised government than it had ever been before. King David also managed his relationship with the Gallic elite far better than any of his brothers before him. The Kingdom of Scotland had certainly changed over the reign of King David, and by 1150 the King was an old man preparing for the next generation to take over. His nephew, William Fitz Duncan, had died in 1147, and King David's son was an able man with plenty of experience to rule. Yet, structured plans can flip like a coin in the medieval world, and by 1152, Prince Henry had died after a long illness, throwing King David's plan of a secure succession up in the air. He was now experiencing what his friend and tutor, King Henry, felt some 32 years earlier, and had to scramble a quick succession plan. Luckily for King David, he had grandsons who could inherit the throne, but they were still too young to rule. To prevent any distant or close relative from seizing the throne as had happened in England, King David appointed a regent who he knew he could trust, the Earl of Fife. King David then ordered the young Prince Malcolm to tour Scotland in an act to show the legitimate successor, and to secure the earldom of Northumbria, he went with his second grandson, William, to Newcastle, to again show the legitimate heir to the earldom, and to double shore up the succession, King David took hostages. By 1153, King David knew his end was coming, and he sought to enter God's peace. The Chronicle of Malrose summarises King David's reign. David was king in Scotland for 29 years, warily discerning what was provident. After he had fortified the kingdom with castles and arms, the king is said to have died an old man at Carlisle. <laughs>